Yeah, well, Aaron Bannon, we're going to kick off today. I'm super excited, feeling more excited. Um, we've covered many of his works in this class, actually. Um, <laughs> he looked at the syllabus and was like, what am I going to talk about? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, luckily, he has some more work that we haven't covered yet. Um, Aaron invented the uh, peaceful CNN, which we covered in the first lecture. Um, uh, Wade Mech. Right. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, great uh, to give a talk here, a lecture. Um, <clears throat> so today I'll talk about yeah something different than than uh, like pixel scene and WaveNet. I've seen that you already covered that. So yeah, um, this will be something different, um, and I'll explain the title later. Um, I'm going to talk about two methods here. So that one will be like vector quantization V. I think you don't have that covered yet. And um, I'll also talk about contrastive predictive coding from a, from a different view than that was presented. And I'll go much quicker over that. <clears throat> but both of these can be seen as like latent space gendered models or how we can move away from the pixel space. So this will be like a mix of uh, a bunch of different things. Uh, first, I'll give you like some um, like bird eye view of the field, like what I think is happening, what I think is exciting, uh, and uh, so like some intuitions, what I think, why things are working. Uh, so and then I'll also zoom in into very specific parts I think are like crucial, like what, why why are these things working? Like for example, why does the contrast of loss make sense? Uh, and yeah, that's all I cover. So let's get started. Um, so I probably don't have to pitch this to you as you're already in this course. Um, and you've probably heard this from, from different people already. But I'll probably maybe give it in a di slightly different way. Also, I don't think this is like, like trivial, trivial at all, right? I don't think it, it's, that makes that much sense. If, uh, it's that easy to understand why enterprise learning is, is, is actually important. If you look at the success of like machine learning, supervised learning like, works extremely well, actually. Um, all of the main successes have worked with, with supervised learning. You can construct the loss such that you get exactly what you want out of the system. Um, it generalizes to the test set. If I had a company or like, like a startup and you have some data, um, and it's just like uh, you can you can form it as a supervised learning problem. The first thing I would do is just like label the data. Uh, that's just like it's probably the cheapest way. They, unless you want to spend some researchers uh, for a few months on like self supervised learning. At the moment, it, it's still like you just want to do like uh, you just want to label the data and get on with it. Um, but I think this is this times are changing, and soon I think will be like uh, there might be a paradigm shift. And I think in some places it's already happening. And uh, I think soon this will happen in many different places. So this is your RL, RL agent, right? Uh, before it gets its first reward. <clears throat> it's like, doesn't see anything, doesn't know anything. It's just like acting completely randomly. Um, probably more randomly than this, than this kit, which has some priors. Um, but it's, it's it's just like bumping into the walls all the time. Uh, the, there is no gradient, external gradient. Uh, the value just goes to zero, um, and that's it, right? There's, there's nothing going on inside the, inside the agent. But yeah, you're getting all of these like very high little, like high resolution images as observations, right? You, and you also have the actions. You could. There's so much data to learn from before you even get the first reward. If you have an infinite, infinite number of like data without any rewards, you should be able to learn a pretty good transition model, maybe, and you know how to learn, how to get from A to B. And as soon as you have a reward, 
you should be able to match that much quicker to something, like could it assign that to something in the observations much more quickly than you would normally do. Um, and then hopefully, you should be able to get from, from A to C and then get the reward uh, more, much more quickly. Um, so it's, it's all about like um, data efficiency. But even if, if, if you have enough data, right? Like I think, um, for example, if you're doing StarCraft, like, or like if you're doing Dota, you have so much, so much like uh, data or like so much, so many agents. I don't think, I think that um, intelligence should still be measured as like how fast you do something, right? Like how fast you learn something. Like data efficiency is like key to intelligence, I think. Um, if you have to do this course 100 times before you pass, I wouldn't describe that as very intelligent, right? And this is exactly what RL agents do. They have, they have seen every kind of question that they know exactly of this. They've seen every question like 100 times and they, they know that if I fill this, this, the expected answer will be like bad or whatever, right? Um, so why, why can we do better, right? So, so if, if you see, for example, the observation space is like 100, like million of bits or whatever. And in the end, you get a reward, like a, like one bit of information, it's true, not like you did well or you did it uh, badly. So that, that is just like an under-constrained problem. There's a million ways of explaining the data, right? You, you could maybe bake some priors into the model, like you use comb nets instead of fully connected networks. That brings down that problem like an order of magnitude. But there's still like many ways to explain exactly like that, that reward in the end. Maybe there's like, a blue pixel somewhere in that image, and that if you if you press forward in, in a, and then you're gonna be rewarded in the end or something. So the, this, these models can overfit really quickly on this data, and then that's why you need a huge ton of information. And the same is true for semi-supervised learning. Uh, maybe we can we don't need that much data, and maybe in the future we can just like learn much more quickly um, with a lot less labels. And yeah, the key is, of course, to predict the inputs themselves. Like, if you can predict the future, you should be able to do... There's, like, a lot of signal there. Like, the, the, I mean, gradient starts flowing. You, you get a lot of, like, the model starts learning everything that there is to, do, to learn. Um, but then the question is, will it learn something useful, right? If you just, like, learn, it can learn everything about, about how the trees are moving and everything. But yeah, you should be paying attention to the road. I mean, and uh, so... I guess the question is, of self-supervised learning, how do you, can you make sure that the prediction task is actually useful for downstream problems? And I'll, that's, it, that's what I talk, I'll talk about today. Another thing is that rewards often correlate well with changes in the input. For example, in, in here, so if, if one of the ghosts gets Pac-Man, then Pac-Man gets transported back to the start. Uh, if you can predict when, like if you predict uh, if a, a prediction of the future, and you predict that Pac-Man will be at the start, then something has changed in the state of the game, right? And you, you will predict that. And if you, there's probably like a bit in your last yum or something that, that says, have you been caught or not? And so once you, so if you predict the future, you should be able to do well in predicting if you're going to get caught or not. The same is true for like if you take the, the food. If you, the, the, you, you will, you will eat them and they will be gone. So you have something representation that will say those that the flat food is gone. So there's something changed in the state. So you can maybe predict from the change in the state if you get a reward or not. So you should be able to do much better at predicting what gives you a reward or what, 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 what the value is. If you see that the ghosts are close, then you'll predict that you're going to be in the center of the screen. And that's bad for the, for the value function. So let's talk about some like trends. I guess unsupervised learning can be split up into like two parts. There's like the self-supervised learning, like make your own like um, proxy task that hopefully correlates well with the downstream performance. And then there's also like generative models. And sometimes there's an overlap and sometimes not. So I'll first talk about like supervised like self-supervised learning. Um, what what's currently um, has a really big impact in like in self-supervised learning is BERT. Um, so in language modeling or like uh, NLP, that that does just a very big paradigm shift there. I guess they've 
been also with the first to explore self-supervised learning, or one of the first, like with Ward Truvac and, and all follow-up papers on that, on that. But they see like really big gains compared to supervised learning already. Now, this is not the case for some other fields, like, for example, computer vision. Um, everyone just uses the labels there is, so right, you can, and what's worse, like, or like, even better, I guess, like, transfer learning works really well from supervised speed training. So you train uh, a network on a mission net, and then you can do really well on, like, other, all the other tasks by, by just using that network. Um, so there, they, there is no, I mean, that hasn't been, like, supervised, self-supervised learning isn't there yet. And, uh, I guess, but I think things are happening really, really fast there. Soon, I think self-supervised learning should be able to get close to like supervised learning performance, maybe in the next two years. And I mean, you'll see that, that like things are going really, really fast in the net in the next few years, I think. Or in computer vision in general. So and then generative models. Um, the trend is like more compute helps. And it's actually kind of sadly like a lot of improvements have come just by using more compute. I, I, it would be fun to have more creative solutions as well, but like it's true, and and maybe slightly over, maybe luckily that's. I mean, I guess we have more compute, so it's it's just it's it's fun to have other kind of models for free, um, but that's happening for sure. And then there are also hierarchical models. It's a super raw idea, but like the details of how you actually use it matters. Um, so you get better global structure. You're you're gonna. Spend more capacity on things that matter that we, we like, the, we care about global structure and so on. So their hierarchical models are really useful. And then there is all, we've also seen some architectural improvements. And this is the same for like self-supervision as well. Uh, like self-attention has come out and works really well. Um, and, but I think there might be something after self-attention. So there we have like LSTMs, we have, um, mask convolutions or like, causal convolutions, and now we have self-attention. Um, there might be something else after that. Some people say a self-attention is all you need. Some people say it's not all you need, and those are actually from the same group anyway, so <laughs> from Google Brain. So I think the key is just to combine different ways and uh, keep improving the architectures. So I guess this is like the landscape of generative models at the moment. So GANs, I guess, are like state of art in like sample quality. Uh, so there is big GAN, style GAN, um, and they, they've made huge progress. Um, so the quality is really good for these models. They have high resolution samples. They're sharp. Um, so that's all the good things. The bad things is that the diversity of these models are quite low. So they, they will able to do really well by just removing some modes of data that they can't model well. And that's actually, you could say that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so the diversity isn't, isn't that low. And there's also like, they're hard to evaluate. So people use inception scores, FID scores, but I don't think those are really good metrics. Also, they, they're, they're not capturing everything. They're like a, a, a mixed bag. So some people say FID captures like diversity. I don't, I don't think it, it, it does at all. Um, but it does correlate somewhat with like the, the quality of these images. I think the best metric, if you care about sample quality, is still like human evals. Um, and especially if you have a conditional giant of model, that, that's the best way of doing that. Um, so there, there's a still another question of how do we, uh, evaluate these models and do they, like, how can we measure a generalization as well? Like, and how, how do we know they can generate samples from the test set? In, uh, in machine learning one on one, you learn that like test set and validation set is really important, but now, uh, we're not using that for GANs, I guess. Um, but at the same time, we, we, we have actually the, I mean, if you care about like sample quality, you sh everything we should do, I mean, human evaluations, I think that's, that actually, exactly ma like measures what we care about, right? And these are, these are super useful techniques, for example, for super resolution, because that's exactly what you want to do. Then there's VEs. Uh, so they have latent, uh, latency, so that's really useful. And then, they're like likely based methods, um, but they're like likely aren't that um, super great at the moment. Uh, so they're lacking. There maybe this 
close to flow, but it's not also not at a progressive level yet. The good thing is they're also really fast to generate sample from, and um, the samples are often slightly blurry. Flow-based models have improved drastically over the last year, like with uh, low and so on, low plus plus, and then so the, the log likelihoods are still lacking behind of other aggressive models. Uh, we don't know if they're ever going to catch up, but they're, they've improved a lot, and uh, they also have like the, the good quality that they, they sell as fast as something from. Then other aggressive models are state of the and log likelihood. Um, they're slow to sample from. Um, and they often tend to zoom in on like the, the local texture, like the, the local structure. So there we need to kind of mix in hierarchical models. So what I'll talk about today is that we have to move away from pixels. Like, and we want to model everything in the latent space, at least for, for some, for some cases. Not if you want to generate samples, but if you want to do something like like with a model-based RL, for example, right? Imagine you're like a model-based RL agent and you want to predict what you'll see or what, what you'll do two hours from now. You're, you're going home. Are you going to take the BART? Are you going to take the bus or take an Uber? Uh, and so one, so the good thing is you're a model-based RL agent. So you, you don't have to do all, all of these a million times before you get the good values over those uh, options. You can plan in advance what you think is like the fastest way to get home and the cheapest. So, uh, so that's good, but you have to, you have to make a prediction about the future, right? Um, and you don't want to generate like, for example, a 4K resolution image of a bus when you make this prediction about the future. You would, you don't want to make these predictions in like pixel space because you don't want to like, predict what exactly the colors of the, the leaves are going to be or who is going to be sitting next to you on the bus, what they're doing. That all does not matter for like this, like the, the, the problem you're trying to solve, right? Like what, which one is the fastest to get home? Um, so what you're going to, what you will be able to predict is like where the bus is, um, what time and like where, where, where you're going to be. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm like all of these high level things, right? And that's actually the stuff you would like to predict. So if you can make some kind of latent space where you have these, these abstract representations and you predict in that space instead, you can do much better in this, in this planning task, right? That's, that's how humans do it. And I don't think, uh, like AlphaGo style, like trying all the, all the steps all the way there, um, uh, like to predict all pixels, I guess, in this, in this, uh, if you pay pixel level model, uh, general model wouldn't work here. Um, but how do you get this, uh, this latent space? And we don't have, you don't want to label the data because, I mean, that's, you don't even know what, what this latent space contains and like, how do you, how do you get there, right? So I guess what I'll talk about is like VQV and CPC and they're kind of two different ways of getting this latent space. And the way you can see it is that VQV will only model what we can Perceive like we don't we don't want to uh, like predict the noise in this image or like the like high frequencies that we as human eye we cannot even see, so we don't we don't want to do any of that. And CPC will be like kind of like if you zoom out, it's like model only what we can predict. So you, you don't want to predict anything in this image that you won't be able to predict from from now on. So like you have like a current state and the plan, what information can you predict from this image in the future? Uh, and that's that's kind of what CPC does. So let's start with model what we can perceive. Um, so I guess the idea is like comes from like compression. Like we all know like JPEG works quite well like for compressing the size of images. Everything we do is like we send over the over the over the internet is basically almost like a JPEG image. And we know that get, it gives us like temp 10x like smaller images, and we don't even see the difference because everything you see on your image, like that's all all like JPEGs anyway. So we were not bothered with that, and they contain the most information, uh, useful information. So if we can like get a, a compressed latent representation that gets rid of all those like things we don't can, cannot even see, that that's a that's a win, right? So and then we can use that to make our transformers better. 
And the work that, that we did is, is called VQV, and we use a discrete latent space, but the idea kind of holds in general. Uh, so you kind of have an encoder that you make your latents. Um, they are like much, uh, the, the information in that, on those latent space is much smaller than in the image, or like in this case, the audio. And then we have a decoder that tries to reconstruct from those latents the original. And the key is that if you can reconstruct the original as good, that, that we don't even can hear it, or like it sounds good enough, or like it looks good enough, and uh, the codes are much smaller than the original image, then we should use the codes in set and move on. Um, so yeah, so it's all about like moving to a, like moving away from the pixels, and we want to learn you know, abstractions. So we really want to get remove things that we don't care about, like abstract away noise and details, so that the task becomes easier. And I won't talk about too much about why we use discrete latent space instead of like a continuous latent space. I don't think it matters too much for this for this talk, uh, but I think the main reason is that. Like it's, it's much easier to have like a, a discrete bin so you can do a, a softmax over it instead of if you have, for example, a continuous space, you would need like six or whatever more like um, feature planes. Instead, either you have a single feature plane, you have a single softmax over, and otherwise you would have to do auto aggressive over those continuous states as well. Um, so that, I mean, that's just why we took this approach. Uh, vector quantization. Oh, by the way, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I should have told you in the beginning, but like, I think it's much better if people interrupt me well and have questions while we talk. Uh, because sometimes I forget to say things that are actually, things that are not, not obvious and that makes, makes everything much more, like, make much more sense if I uh, explain it. So the, uh, yeah. Um, so the, the input, I guess, is also a finite number of bits because it's, it's quantized. Um, so, uh, for example, it, like, colors are quantized to 8-bit. But, I mean, it, you can approximate, like, saying that it has a lot of bits in it. Um, and, yeah, so we, we are definitely throwing away bits. Like, the, 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 the reduction is, say, like, uh, as you, uh, you'll see, like, 48 times smaller than the original space. Um, and that makes it 48 times easier to model, 48 times uh, faster to sample from, and so on. And this is also kind of what people have done with, like, even, like, flow-based models. They've, they've quantized the, the number of colors, so to, like, 4 bits instead of 8 bits, for example, because those last 4 bits are, like, less visible to us, and the model is going to care as much as those 4 bits as about the four, 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 uh, first bits, right? Uh, because look likely this model is going to encode, they capture everything, and if you have 24-bit color, then you're going to spend a lot of time just modeling the color really well. And we're like, well, that's that that color is almost the same as that, so that's fine. But for look like base models, that's like the world of difference, right? Like any color is different. Makes a, is is a every color is equally different from each other color. And BQV is kind of like an extreme version of that, where we can try even more than just the the pixels individually. And we can also, like, uh, because you have an encoder and decoder, you can also, because, like, a lot of the images are just flat, right? Like, there's a lot of stru structure and there's a lot of, like, correlation between every pixel. Uh, so, like, PCA is also a nice, like, view, like, view on that. Like, if you throw away, like, most of the components, the original is still, like, reconstructed pretty well. But you have to throw away those long tail bits to, to get, uh, to get the area. Yeah, so the the fact that yeah the latents are different, um, and the way you train it is also different. We use like a straight through estimator. They they have a continuous representation uh, trick, and then we 
So the, the, the objective also is slightly different. So I guess there's the KL and then there's the reconstruction cost and they're e weighted equally. So like in EVE, we will have like, we give a fixed amount of bits in the latency and say like use all you can. Like there's like a, an upper, upper bound of how much latency you can use. It's like you cannot go over this and then try to reconstruct well, as well as possible with that. So it's not um, a fully likely based model, but we just like saying, it's like, like, it's like lossy compression almost. Um, given this number of bits, try to reconstruct well, as well as possible. And it's like a, it's like a mean squared error reconstruction. Um, so for example, here, so let's say the image, input image like 120 by 128, then latent space in our case would be 32 by 32 latents um, by one. So the image has three color channels. We have only one channel there. But the colors have like 256 possible values. We have here like 512, but you could also do 256, that's up to you. And then we try to reconstruct those as well as possible. Um, and for example, these are the reconstructions we get. Um, so on the left you see the originals, on the right you see the reconstructions. But the latent space is 48 times smaller. Right, so this, this makes the model, makes it easier, make 48 times easier to model with a fixed screen. And, and it's not going to care about like the high level, the high, high frequency noise or like the noise in the image because that's gone. And it's just only going to care about like the global structure. Um, yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I'm going to show you that uh, right now. So, it, it's actually um, deterministic in this case. So, the, the posterior is kind of like, it takes one of the codes, and that goes to the decoder. So, you don't sample one of the codes, you just take the nearest neighbor. So, for example, here, you have an embedding space of all of different codes. So, the, here, there were like 10 possible values of your discrete latent. And they are all embedded in some like latent space. The encoder outputs this green point in this, in this latent space, and you look at the nearest point in this latent space, and this will be E2 here. So you send the number two to the, to the decoder, uh, and that will basically uh, try to reconstruct as well as possible. Then you get a gradient from the decoder to E2, but then because the encoder has outputted the green plot, Point, we just copy the gradient and apply it to the green point. So there's like a bias there, right? Because if you would have sent this point, the gradient might have been in this way. But if you take the gradient here, it's like that. And if you, you copy it to, to this place here. So that's called the straight through estimator. But if you have enough points, and this, this space is, is part of a lot of points, like 5,000 points in our case, then that's, this works pretty well. Um, and you get discrete latency for in this, in this case, in this way. Yeah? Exactly, yeah. So all of this is just like how you get the latent space, and then how you predict that latent space is, well, that's for the pixel scene, and I'll show you later, yeah. So that you just encode and reconstruct, you get the latent space, and that's discrete. And, uh, and this is kind of like an information theoretical bottleneck. A KL is like a, like a V is also has a different information theoretical bottleneck. But if you just have a normal autoencoder, that is not an information theoretical bottleneck and you can send as much as information. If you have like a more nonlinear uh, encoder, you're gonna send more and more bits until you can send like everything in, t in one value, right? Like in one float, 32, there are like 32 bits and you could send a lot of that in there. Um, but this is like, you can count the number of bits exactly in, in that space. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, also, this model is not that big, so it, it wouldn't overfit at all. So actually, the models we used in this, for the VKV, are always like pretty shallow. Like they're maybe like two transpose convolutions and then two res, res blocks. And you, make, you can make it a lot deeper, but there's not that much gain over it. Um, I wouldn't know by like the exact number, but let's say there are only like, yeah, 
less than a million, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, you cannot. So yeah, you, you can learn. Well, you will go to the constructor with like a regular autoencoder, but that space is going to be like. Like if you take a piece of paper and you wrap it all up uh, into like a ball, uh, that if if you sample one of those points in the 3D space, you're going to be off the manifold always. So like if you try to predict that space, there's no way that I mean you cannot predict in that space anymore because if you just predict slightly off the manifold, then you're going to get a sample that's not uh, a real image. Um, but you cannot get that beta V because the, the posterior adds noise to it. So they're, they're, they're like kind of fill up the space. And with this stuff, every code maps to something in the, the, the decoder knows every code. So it's, it's hard. You cannot sample codes that don't, don't exist, right? So for example, in here, you own, the only options are those 10 um, purple points. You cannot send a code that's, that's here. So the, it kind of fall off kind of the manifold, if you wish. Um, but it's like, there are other reasons for them we can chat off with a plan later. Um, so you need like kind of an information tile bottleneck, there will be a bottleneck to model that space directly with a, a different model. So then once you have that encoder decoder framework set up, and that trains really fast, by the way, then you can train something on top that to predict in that space directly. And that should be much easier and faster to train. So in this case, we use a pixel CNN and we sample this 32 by 32, like smaller latent image. Uh, and then once that's sampled, we take that image and we use the decoder to give us the, the real rendering, the real image. Um, and that's 128 by 128 times three. So that's for free. So we have modeled a bigger image in a much smaller in space. Um, and this is, these are the samples we got back then. So this is two years ago. Um, we've got some new stuff and I'll show you that later. Uh, so this fresh press. Yeah. Um, so I think once you've done like one stage, uh, doing another stage, I think might be, might be possible, but it would, um, it would be, it's much harder to compress more than that, I think. Also, for example, if you do VQP on text, text is already very, quite high level, already quite compressed. I think that's also why, like, language models work really well, like these self-suppressed things. And because, like, text is much easier to predict than, than pixels, like high level patches of pixels. But, uh, it's hard to compress more than that. Uh, but I'll show you, like, a way of, well, how we do like hierarchical uh, like DQV is later. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so there are only five twelve, like. Um, points in the dictionary. So, I mean, that's like, um, so no, that's not a lot of weights. And the test images would also map to the same points. Um, and there's also, like, one code doesn't capture very much. It's because you have, like, a grid of codes. In this case, it would be, like, a 32 by 32 grid of, uh, of latent codes. And it's it's quite similar to, like, a V, Y, V, like, generalizes. Um, um, so... I'm not sure if I answered that correctly. Uh, oh, I see. Um, well, it because like there, are, let's say there are five twelve codes, but like there are like one million images, so you split up one million images by five twelve. Well, like one, like if you had like only look at one latent, right? But the, so. It cannot memorize the data because there are only five twelve points to explain one million images. So there will be like, I guess, two thousand points mapped to every, every every cluster, and that's for every like small patch. And then there, uh, those codes are shared 
over the different locations in the image. So there will be like way, way more data per point and it, it kind of memorize the, the image. Yeah, the different the different images map to the same code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, so. Be cool to do that, but it will be very like very local change in the image. So everything else would look the same. So for example, if you flip a bit in the, in the middle, then this is just gonna be like a slightly different change in that image in, the, in that part. It's it's pretty local and uh, I don't think this captures like very abstract stuff. Uh, well, depend on the, depending on the decoder actually. The, the decoder will decide what the latency encode. This, this is basically more like a, like, um, a channel, right? Like it's like an information channel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what that, that's what Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So it, or like a very very deep ResNet, maybe then they can all map every point maps to every cluster, but it would still kind of yeah. But self attention would be uh, maybe a better way, and. Uh, Later, I'll show you, like, if you put a WaveNet decoder, then you also get different codes. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so, but every image maps to 1,024 of these codes, right? There will be never two images that have exactly those 1,024 codes. For the, yeah, for the whole image, you have 1,024 codes, and then they might share some codes in some locations, but because uh, the reconstructions will also depend on the neighboring codes, and so the, the meaning of the code might be different depending on the neighbors and so on. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. All right. Um, Uh, can you read the first part? Yeah. Um, no, not not really. I mean, we've tried bigger decoders that also worked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we tried a couple of different encoder decoders here, like very big ones as well. But I mean, the gains you get are like pretty minor compared to like, if you make the pixel scene that much bigger that you get way better gains. Uh, there's just, there's like a limit to what like, or how much compressible the data is, I, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you also have like, you also use the same straight through estimator for like the wave and decoders and everything. Um, so yeah, these are like old samples, like same for DM lab. This is much easier to model even, much more smaller domain. And you can stack them on top of each other. Like for, for this, this kind of worked. We have to like three global latents in the second stage for like, uh, DM lab. So like here you can see that there is only 27 bits for the whole image, uh, that it has to abstract away a lot of information and it cannot leak. And it cannot reconstruct perfectly. And here we had like a, a pixel scene and decoder inside the thing. It's kind of complicated to explain, but as you can see, it does get some stuff correct, but it, it loses information in some points um, because obviously there is no way you can map all of this image to 77 bits, and there has to be some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this was pre-trained, for example, like you first train the encoder and decoder, and then you train another one that maps to three latents, three global latents, and then you have a pixel scene and that tries to predict from that. Uh, those are fixed, are frozen, yeah. You've already trained that, you don't need to, yeah. 
And then you can do also like video generation as latent space, which is much cheaper than an original because like it's like, yeah, as I said, 48 times smaller. So training is faster, sampling is faster. Uh, it generalizes, I mean, it, 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 it focuses on the high level st structure. And then, so we also apply this to speech. Uh, and here we, we have like a, like, a, it's 64 times smaller. Um, and we use 128 codes. Um, so 128 possible like code points in the discrete, in the discrete space. That is then used to the, to like condition the wave net. And the wave net tries to just predict the next step condition on the codes. Um, and hopefully we can reconstruct well enough that it sounds like the original. So let's, let's have a look how that sounds like. So this is like the original sound, the original speech that we put in. Okay, October 16th. Do you want to save this? Okay, October 16th. Do you want to save this? So you can see that, uh, or you can hear that the words are the same, but it, it's, it, the prosody is different. Um, and so it, it has sent like the, the, the phonemes, but it, ha or like something that's, that resembles phonemes or whatever, like this, the sound, but not, it has lost like the, the prosody. So if you sample multiple times, you would hear that it says it always in a different way. The, the intonation is always different. There's another one. Every day at 6.35. Every day at 6.35. And if you look at how the, the reconstruction and the original look like the waveform, the, the waveforms are totally different. So it has really resynthesized the waveform based on the codes. It's not trying to match every like sample correctly. And that's because like a, a, a wave net, um, can deal with that, uh, like high level abstract representation. So if, if, if you know, we know that if you condition wave net on the phonemes, it is able to generate the text correctly. And it will always generate a different waveform based on that. So it has sent like some high level stuff and then resynthesizes everything else. Yeah. Um, no, we haven't tried that exact experiment, but we have tried something else I'll show you later. So if we can, um, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. yeah, that's a wavelength decoder. Yeah. So if you if you have a feed forward decoder, then it tries to match every sample identically, right? Like correctly, and then mean error tries to like extends to blur the reconstruction so that you would lose all the high frequency information here. Um, so means that will be really bad metric for this case, but for images, it kind of, kind of is kind of quite it works quite well because also like that's what they use in like for example image compression that's it's still used like this is still the default training loss, and that because we don't care about the high level uh, frequencies, um, but yeah for 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 audio wave net decoder works much better than that means that. So the next thing we can do is then we can model the discrete latents directly, and. Um, so now we train a wave net prior. So we, we have this wave net decoder already. We have the latent, so we can train a wave net on top of the latent. So that latent space is 60 times, 64 times smaller than the original space. So it's much easier to like learn long, long term coherent structure, like, like a, almost like make a language model on top of the audio. Um, and this is what that sounded like. So. It's never been in their songs on a designed opens in Delmart and Anson Brevoy and in Presidents One One by Ronomus Bats to Sanich by hearing Tilt Tob. So you can hear some some words that start to make sense. If you if you would do this directly on the audio, you would hear that's like much more like like uh, mumbling like like um, it just makes up like new sounds, but no like no consistent words. If you would do this. Now when you have a big data set, I think you get like almost like partial like like sentence structures here and there, I would think. Um 
Sex 269 34 year tickets be in the Raymond Aperiton in early and fall for him such. Just see or I'm sure more of repeated it tonight. Um, and then something else we can do is like, what if we give the speaker ID to the, to the WaveNet for free? So we tell him like that this, we also send an information at another channel and say that's, that's a speaker that's going to speak. So that means like, it doesn't need to send the speaker ID anymore into the latency, right? Because nobody has that information. It would then send information that is like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't try to send redundant information because the, if the bottleneck is limited. So it tries to send different information than the speaker. Um, and the cool thing is that if you then at test time use a different speaker, you can see if, if it can really still, still resynthesize something with that new speaker and those, uh, like latents. So this is the original. We are encouraged by the news. And um, so we send the latents and we take a different speaker. We are encouraged by the news. And if you hear like closely, you can also hear that it, it's also sent like the, like the sound of in the beginning. So it has like a, maybe a code for that, for that sound as well. We are encouraged by the news. Um, Obviously, it doesn't know what phonemes are, and that happens maybe a few times in the data set, so it made a special special code for that. That's another example. Who was the mystery MP? Who was the mystery MP? So this gives us a, like, a way to style transfer the audio to a new speaker. Under Alex Ferguson, Aberdeen showed it could be done. Under Alex Ferguson, Aberdeen showed it could be done. And then we tried, to, like, Oriol said something in, in Spanish. I think. Hola, ¿cómo estás? So that's, like, that speaker is not on the data set, right? We hope that the encoder has learned, uh, like, something general, but that it can send some codes for that speech as well. Like, it has never seen Spanish or Oriol in the data set. And then this is what we got. Hola, ¿cómo estás? So it tries to, like, Try to resemble, like, something that resembles the original. Obviously, it cannot do it perfectly. Um, how much, what are, what time are we? Okay, maybe the, let's take a break. Um, yeah, after, like, after this. Yeah. I still have, I'm like, maybe slightly over halfway. No, 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 actually, not over halfway. Even, yeah. So like almost, almost, almost halfway, I think. Okay, sounds good. Like uh, yeah, I know when we will we'll do break. Okay. Um, yeah. Um. So, he, yeah, the decoder is still the same. It's it's a, a general decoder that takes any of the discrete latents, and it takes the speaker ID, and it tries to reconstruct. Uh, but we can change the speaker ID. So, like, we just flip this number. Yeah, so we just change this number to a different speaker, and then we can resynthesize, like, some, some different uh, sound. Um... I think I think that's that would be quite I mean, that, that would be even more high level. And then you need something that's like yeah, it has a meaning of words. But like unsupervised translation, there are some papers on that, and and uh, but not this not this, this model. But I can I can think of that that there might be some something like if you really have like um, I mean I, there are some papers that that does do this, but not with speech, but um. um I, because the discrete lanes are still like a temporal sequence, it would still be aligned to the phonemes or like some some sequence. Um, yeah, so that 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 that's why it wouldn't work for this case. Um, but it ha but it hasn't disentangled the the latents like like the phoneme structure like everything from the speaker idea. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but I, I, I also, well, it sends more than I think just the meaning. It sends like the exact, like the phonemes, right? Like the it sends that that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think the meaning will be uh, like a higher abstraction, and it, yeah, that, that's not very, yeah. Thank you. Can you repeat the last part? So, um, if, if, if I think it's like really hard to find it, it's like a bit hard yeah. to find it, it's not pretty easy to find it on the internet. Yeah. But if it is a really complicated algorithm that you can use to find it out, and you can kind of test on it, that might be a good way to do it. And then you can kind of like test on it again and again and again. And then you can kind of like find it. Is that what you're saying? So, you, you're, I guess the, the question is like, you need a multi speaker data set to, for this to work. Um, but I think I think it's it's easier to collect this for the data for this model than for a text to speech system because um, there's a lot of like unsupervised. So this doesn't use any supervised signal. Right? You don't have to um, like do ASR to get the phonemes, or like you have to. You don't have to manually label everything that the person says. So you can just collect speech from YouTube or like from other sources. Um, and I guess that's easier than to to label the data. Um, but yeah, the, the the goal of this system is not really to do like a a text to speech system. But yeah, you could also do something like you have an ASR model that tries to like predict the text. Then that text is then um, used with a text to speech model to resynthesize the original in a in a new a new way. But um, that that would be a different way. But is it just is it end to end? And um, it learns to, it could also like maybe if you have more latency, it will be able to, able to, to also send like the, the intonation in the in the audio or like more, more information, like the way it's set or like the tempo and everything. While an ASR system would get rid of that information or it would be much harder to label afterwards. Right? So um, yeah, that's the answer. Um, and For example, we tried to use this system for audio compression, so like speech compression. And this is exactly where what this model does, right? So it compresses. It's like an extreme version of compression for like for speech. Um, and so we have we compared this to uh, like a few different systems that are like optimized for speech directly, and we just learned this. Uh, this this is exactly this kind of this model we used. So on the right axis you see the score of the system, and on the x axis you see like the number of bits used in a log scale, right? Um, so if you if you have uncompressed speech, you get like say 95 percent score, and then if you use uh, AMR WBs, uh, then you but you use twenty four thousand bits per second, you also get like something like ninety two. And so we use only like a thousand six hundred bits per per second, and we got seventy percent. Like the R score is like about seventy. Well, there are two, like a state of the art is like mouth and speaks, which use more more bits per second, but got like a much worse, like a lower score, in the reconstruction score uh, loss. So, uh, and it's really cool that we can learn this like model like end to end. It, it learns to like abstract away stuff that's not important uh, to send over the wire, and then we synthesize the audio from it directly. So it's, um, it's like perceptual compression, if you, if you want to. Say. And another thing we can do with this is like, well, we have an encoder, and the 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 codes kind of resemble like phonemes. Uh, we 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 saw that it kind of sends like the the, the phoneme level information, but we're interested to see what kind of exactly it sends, right? So here we have uh, a plot that shows like the discrete codes on the on the 
on the x-axis and then on the on the, the phonemes on the y-axis. And this is like a co-occurrence matrix. So which code is being sent for which phoneme? So this is like zone after it's like that we just look at the data and then analyze how many times a discrete word code was used for um, when a certain phoneme was in the audio. And you can see that this is this matrix is pretty sparse. Um, and if you just map every discrete code to a certain phoneme, you get like 50% accuracy. Uh, and, and this is fully unsupervised. Um, obviously, this was for like a single speaker. But then we um, we have another paper, uh, which um, John Tarowski, who has done a lot of ex ex more experiments on this and tries to push really like the performance of the system. Um, and here we have like the on a um, like a competition data set. So we have zero speech 2017. Um, that this is challenge that tries to learn the phonetic unit phonetic units in, in speech for different languages. And the, the ABX score is the lower the better. So I guess this um, paper would be state of the art. Heck at all. Uh, that one was the competition winner and we we beat that method for our languages except for Mandarin. Uh, so like English and French we do uh, much better. And we, 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 we didn't try to make anything speech specific for this metric, right? Um, the reason why we do worse for Mandarin is that if you, if you remember, the prosody was gone in the reconstructions. So the, the model I try gets rid of the prosody and that, that's really important for the meaning in Mandarin. So that, that's why, uh, I think we do more, worse in that language. So it's really cool that the, the, those level that was, Discrete latents do learn like some high level, uh, like phonetic units, um, representations just from scratch and in a supervised way. Cool. So now let's take a break and then we'll get back to this. All right. Let's continue uh, the lecture. Um, so I've, Thought, told you about like VQV, and this is like our latest work that's not published yet that will soon come out uh, with VQV. But let's call it now VQV2, but it doesn't have a real name even yet. Um, so this, this work was together with Ali Razavi and Oriol Vignols. Um, and we, we basically took the same idea and scaled it up. Um, there's little yeah, like architectural innovation here, um, a little bit, a little bit maybe, but it's mainly like um, minimal innovation, like maximal results, as as like Ilya Suskiver would say. Um, so let's let's start maybe with uh, like a game. Uh, let which ones of these dogs are like not real? Bottom left is not real. What else? What am I, is not real? They're all real? So there's, the, there's only what, like, there's only one that's real. And that's the top left, the top left corner. That's the real image. Everything else is generated. Um, so this is what it looked like before. And now we have, um, like, much better, uh, images. So here we have like a more of a hierarchy. So there are two uh, like latent maps this time. So we have an encoder that maps to like the latent space we had before, like four times smaller in the I x and y uh, dimension of the image. And now we also have a second encoder. It goes a bit deeper and then also puts like an even smaller uh, latent image. Um, the decoder for the for this, for this latent image, like the, the slightly bigger one, can look at what it already quantized in the higher level. So it wouldn't quantize the same thing twice. It wouldn't send the same information again because that wouldn't help the loss, right? So it will try to model like residual information in the second latent uh, stage here. And then the decoder takes both of these representations 
and reconstruct sewage in as well as possible. Yeah, so it, yeah, it could only use that, for example, but then if it's not using that, the top, the top prior, um, I mean, it could use it for free and it will just get better, a better loss using that as well. Um, Um, so the reason why we have a second stage and is, this one is smaller is that we want to bake in like a hierarchical structure. Like the top prior will like get the global structure and then we add more information in the second one which looks at more local structure and so on. Um, and that makes, you'll see that the, the samples are like get a more globally coherent when you do that. Um, because there are like fewer mistakes to make. Like if you have a big image and you start with the top left corner and you're going to sample all the way down, if you make a, a mistake along the way, everything else is like, is bad. But if you have, if you first sample this part and then you, you're in this part, any mistake you're going to make is, is going to be much more local uh, than, 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 yeah. So looking at like the dimensions, like the, this space is 48 times smaller and this space is like 192 times smaller than the original space. I will use, still use means error, like the, I guess the, the stupidest loss you could use, but it works qu quite well and uh, resembles what, I mean, it learns like the correct thing, even though it's like the easiest thing you could think of. So this is all trained end to end. So we first train encoder decoder, but in this case it's multi multi resolution, and then after that we train the the pixel scenes. Um, so if you look at the reconstructions, I mean these, these still look pretty well. Maybe if you look if you zoom in really well, you can see there's like some slightly blurriness. Um, but given that we've thrown away so much so much information, I think this is a a win. Uh, so if you look at if you reconstruct from the, the top prior, you get the left image. And you, you just fill in like zeros in the, in the bottom, bottom latents. If you use both latents, you get the right, right image. So you can see that the top latents encode like the global structure of the, of the doc, and then you add more information with the second stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the loss, it's means error. So the, the the objective for both is the means error, and uh, there's also some like loss associated with the VQV, but um, yeah, it's better to it just uh, I won't do I won't do that in this paper and in, in, sorry in this in this talk, but you can look it up in the in uh, on the paper. It's, it's, it's also pretty easy loss to add. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. For this case, it just tries to maximize like the like the reconstruction do as well as possible. Uh, yeah. Um, I think uh sub so you could also subsample the pixels as you, as you say and then try to fill in the details but um i think subsampling is a a worse way of 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 extracting information because i think um these latents will be able to reconstruct the image much better than if you subsample it um it's a much better compressed representation than this subsampled version um yeah yeah so the multi scale pixel scenes and everything like uh that's 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 be that's what they actually did that as well like you just subsample the pixels and then you you train train that up first and then you Sample like the, the residual, like the other pixels, the ones you haven't predicted yet already. Um, but generally, this will will do much better, I think, because it's like 
it really optimizes for that task, right? It tries to get the latency so that actually the most compressed representation of the, of the image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, this, I guess this part would go, like skip this part or something like that. It's, we just skip the VQ. If we've drawn two lines, but you could say like this goes here or something. You could, this part of the decoder is used. Um, but it, you could, that's an option, like you can choose it as you want. It wouldn't matter too much, I think. Um, so that's what I wanted. Um, so now you have two pixel scenes. One is for the top prior. Um, so you sample this like 32 by 32 latent image. And then you have a second pixel scene and that takes that latent image and then is conditioned on that to generate the 64 by 64 latent image. Both of these is then are then combined to generate the 256 by 256 reconstruction. So we have also like made the images much high, like higher res with this with this work. Um, and this is an actual like generation from the model. So let's have a look at like what the samples look like. Um, so this is one of the harder classes I think in ImageNet. Um, so on the right you can, you can see the real images, and on the left you, see, you can see our samples. So we get Pretty good diversity, um, cover most, like all of the modes and so on. And this is, for example, what you would get with Big N. Um, as you can see that Big N has a, like a, the diversity is, is much, much, much smaller than, than what we have. Um, and this is without truncation. So if you have, if you trunc, if you use a truncation trick that GANs use, usually for the getting the good scores, and it's like, uh, even even much the diversity becomes much much smaller even. But look likely based on it's try to me measure like like model everything in a data set so they won't have this problem. Uh, so another example here. So on the right real images on the left we can see our samples. Um, and this is what Bacon does. Um, and we try to find an example where it it zoomed in. Into the like has a very like zoomed in version of, of the of the bird, but we we couldn't find any sample that did that. So we tried really hard to find a sample, but it's so it's it this mo it has just filtered out that mode from the data set to model the other images uh, better in the end. And here are some other samples from our model. They're all class conditions. So every row is, is like a different class. So yeah, I think it's like a lot likely based models are I think improving very quickly, um, and I think will soon be at like the maybe are equal to again or uh, we'll definitely have high diversity and hopefully we get the same, same quality, some, um, image quality. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's, that this is because we have two, two latents, so there's more latents than we had before, I guess. Um, and we, we, I mean, the, the, as you see here, like the reconstructions are good enough and they're not, uh, they're not very blurry. So we know that if we model latents really well, then that should those sa those samples should also not, not be blurry. Um, no, I'm not sure. Like, also, I, I don't know the number of parameters in, in big end. I would have to look it up. I have no idea. Uh, I usually don't check the number of. of They're definitely pretty sizable pixels in and so. Um, so the second idea like is I'm gonna talk about CPC and you can basically if you zoom out, what we're doing is like you try to predict only 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 model what we can predict. 
if you like summarize it. So going back to the bus, you don't want to predict that there is like a, a person on the left. You, 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 there's no way you're you're gonna from from now your current state and the plan that you you cannot predict that there's going to be a person there. You, you're not going to be able to predict like that the exact like um, position of leaves or any other, anything like that, right? Um, so it doesn't make sense to use like a big giant model to model all of that. Everything, all of those, like there's like a, maybe a million bits in here and there's no point in modeling all of those bits. You only want to predict the parts that you can actually predict. And I think one of the key, um, like the best, I think the best way to explain all of this is like using mutual information. Like I think it's a very good, um, way of like, of, th of thinking about it. Um, and I'm not going to try to explain this, this equation, but I'll let's, let's try to like visualize why I think this is, why this, this property is like, is very useful to think and like, uh, and th thinking in, in the mutual information, I think it helps a lot to clarify why, why it's learning these things. So for example, let's assume you have like some kind of toy task. So you have a data set of X and Y pairs. Are you trying to predict Y from X? So you sample some data from the data set and it looks like this. So um, get the different X and Y pairs. And then you need to predict what this thing is, right? So you will know that you're trying to have to, the only thing you know that it's, it's gonna be dog because every X and Y has the same like class label. Um, there's nothing else from that image that you are gonna be able to predict. Not like the pose of the dog, nor anything like that, because it could be any random image of a dog. So, I guess the mutual information between x and y here is the number of class, like log of the number of class labels in a data set. That's the only information that you're going to get from x. Um, so, if you have a conditional giant of model that tries to map um, and learn y from x, it's only going to the only thing it can learn are those two bits. Like in this case, there were four class labels, uh, four classes, so, so there's only two bits of mutual information between X and Y. Um, so if you do it with a generative model, um, so we're doing like, sorry, model P, Y given X, um, then So for example, this image has like 1.5 million bits of information. So let's imagine we use a, like a very powerful conditional general model to model that image conditioned on the left image. So for example, with a pixel cinyan, maybe we get like 500,000 bits, like a three times smaller or something. So the lot the, the pixel cinyan is going to get, keep improving the loss loss over, over and over. Like it's, but the, the number of bits is just going to, improve during training all the time. Um, but if you use the other image to condition the pixel scene on, it will be able to predict that image on the right only by two bits. So it can lower the loss by two bits by looking at the left image. But so there's almost no information or there's almost like no incentive for the pixel scene to care about that left image. It, if it does do like only P of Y, not looking at the other image, it almost gets the same exact loss. And it probably can get a much lower loss by like just improving like low level pixel statistics or like learning everything just to learn about like cat, uh, textures and everything like that. So the pixel is then is just going to spend all its capacity just modeling P of Y. If it only gets two bits from looking at the other image, why would it even care? There's almost no incentive incentive for the model to do that. So that's why probably it's just going to ignore the conditioning. Now, how can we invert this problem? Like, how can we mo make sure that the model only cares about the conditioning? We don't want the model to learn anything about, like, specific, like, low-level statistics about cats. There's no point in that, right? Like, we just want to learn the two bits of information that there is to learn. 
And that's exactly what contrastive losses get us. It's like the, the inverse. And the way they work is that you have uh, the real image, x, and you have so the positive image is, is on the bottom. Uh, and then you just sample random negatives from the data set. And then the, the loss becomes to classify which one is the real pair. And we have a, a soft max over the possible, all the possible um, negatives. So you encode both the, the input and all the negatives, or all the, all the, the possible negatives. And then you do like an inner product between those embeddings to give you a score, and then you do softmax over those. So the only way to do well on this task is to learn the class label. There's no other way you can get the loss to be lower than random if you're not learning the class label about this task. And if you get the perfect loss, it has recovered those two bits of information. So this, this task exactly does only care about those two bits of mutual information. Um, and that ma makes congestive losses for examples like this really, really useful. Obviously, uh, the, the random negatives could also contain a cat, right? There, there is four class levels in this data set, so you're also going to sample random, uh, a cat uh, at random because you don't know, you're not going to use the class level to construct the na negatives, right? You're just sampling random images. But in this case, the model will just assign almost equal probability to those two cats, and that's the best it can do. So the loss will just converge and focus on, on parts it can explain. Um, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So C is the context, and Z, I are like the different images. And we, like, there are embeddings from, that are encoded from the image. And then you can use any kind of metric to see how close they are. But in, in, our, in our case, we just do inner products between. No, no, no. So there, all of these are like, you're not using class labels. So all of these are like the images. So, uh, and then you, extract an embedding for each of the images, and then you just match the embeddings to see how close they are. Um, and the closer they are, the, the higher the score. And then, so the score should be really high for like matching pairs, and then really low for uh, non-matching pairs. And so the app is just like a, in our case, it's just an inner, like a, an, a dot product between these. But, but it, yeah, I mean, then the inner product would be zero for all the negatives, and also would also be zero for the, huh? but also for this image, right? It would be all. It would all, the the inner product. Well, so the, the it's not the same cat. So the inner product would be zero for all the all the four possible images. So, uh, and then you have a softmax over them, it would just give like equal probability all, to all the four images. And then the loss, would, like we would be at like chance level, right? But, uh, the, but then it just hasn't learned anything from the task. So I guess, ah, uh, so, It doesn't have to be that carefully. Um, so is any just classifier network that outputs like a 64 dimensional space or something is good. And then you, that embedding is just matched with the other embeddings. Um, and this F, you just did, did a linear, like a dot product between those embeddings, but you could use anything. And I don't think it matters too much. Uh, 
and also like the classifier you use for this task. I mean, the better it is at extracting, like detecting like images, like class labels, the better it will do at this task as well. So for example, inception or ResNet or whatever. Cool, so yeah, so the, the only way to do well on this task is by learning the class level. Um, so this, this loss is exactly what we want for, for, to solve this task well. But, so there's also, that, that's, that's the good part of the contrastive methods. Now let's go to like, what, in what, which cases they wouldn't work really well. Um, or first, let, let's, maybe, let's explain something else first. So if you're predicting something in the far future, and say like half the images in the data set are like indoors, half the images of the data set are outdoors. So the first thing you will do is like remove all the negatives or like give a very low score to all the negatives that are indoors because you know that in two hours from now you're going to be at the bus stop and it's going to be outdoors. So it's really easy to get rid of those halls. So now you've learned one bit of mutual information between the past, uh, so the, the, the present and the far future. And let's say half the images that are outdoors are in San Francisco and some of them are in like half of them are in Berkeley. So now you also know why you're still going to still going to be in Berkeley, so we get all rid of all the negatives that are in San Francisco. So now you have two bits of mutual information, and you keep doing that. Maybe you know what what time of day it is, or like, right? So maybe let's say you have ten bits of mutual information between now and the far, and the far uh, future. Um, but to do much better than that, so like one in a thousand, like on average, one in a thousand twenty-four. It, negative samples is going to be a, like a close match to the, the real future. So to do much better than 10 bits, you need, like if you're, for example, you want to learn 11 bits of like mutual information, you're going to need twice the number of like negative samples. So this is where contrastive methods do not work really well. Like if the mutual information is high, you're going to need a lot of negative samples to still get gradient signal to do better. But if it's the mutual information is small, then it will learn exactly what you want to learn. Then you don't need a lot, a lot of mutual information. To give you an example, let's say you're predicting the near future, so you have like this, this the current frame, and on the right you see the, the frame you want to predict. If you use a contrastive loss for that, it's going to be really, really hard to find a, like almost the exact same image in, for example, all of YouTube, right? The, the, you're not going to learn really well on this if you use a contrastive loss because all the negatives are too different from the current frame that it's it's super easy to get rid of them. So then the loss will be perfect, but you still haven't learned too much mutual information because like there are like a hundred thousands of bits of mutual information between these two pairs. So the thing is like you want to use contrastive losses wisely. You want to use them when their mutual information is low and they and this can be a really good thing or this can be a bad thing. Yeah, so I didn't, yeah, they, they, this, those could be useful, so that those will be hard negatives, for sure. Like, say, if it was in the same frame. But for the, the so yeah, for, for, the, for the case of video, we still have, like, the, the frames in the same video, that would be very useful to learn. Uh, and you, you would le learn to order them correctly and, and so on. But I was just um, trying to explain that if the mutual information is very high, random negatives are not going to be very useful. Um, so these methods can model like very abstract representations, right? In the case of like data set of X and Y pairs, it will just learn exactly the, the, the class label, something that's like super abstract because there's so many like this, this distribution of all possible cats, cat images is, is super high, right? But it's still, the only thing is, is, is that it learns the class level and it stops there. It's not going to learn anything else. So it doesn't need to be very specific. It just to get, uh, and that's, makes it so that it will be abstract. These contrastive models are lazy and they will send most, more capacity on the harder examples and the easier examples. And if it can explain all the negatives, it will stop there. Um, and yeah, every bit of requires expansion, more negative samples. So this means that self-supervised learning is solved if we can come up with a task where 
there's only a few bits of mutual information which you can predict. So you want to make a task such that the, the X and Y, like the, the context and the future, or like anything like that, the mutual information is very low. And secondly, to predict well, you have to kind of infer relevant information or like class labels to do that. So we've just like um, transformed the task into like creating like a self-supervised task that has these properties. And if you can do that, then your your task uh, will solve. will be solved. So the maybe I'll go back to like this the CPC framework. Like what why? Uh, so I explained to you like the contrastive loss, and now I'll explain to you like the the predictive coding loss, the, the predictive coding part, like why we predict the far future. Um, so if we just predict the next time step, as I said, we can just use lo a lot of like the low level uh, features or like the fast moving variables to do really well on this task. And the mutual information is high. But if you predict something that's far in the future, the mutual information has become very low. Imagine you're talking to someone on the street and you're trying to predict what that person will say like a second from now. You're not going to be able to predict like any of these samples in, in the, or the wiggle of the waveform. The only thing that you can actually predict is like if you infer the words that person is saying, make a language model and predict in that latent space, try to predict the next word that person is going to say. You cannot predict any of the like the low level stuff. Something else you can maybe predict is like the intonation of because that's also like something a slowly varying feature. Um, so by making this task, it has to basically learn the the phonemes and the high level structure. And the further you predict, the more high level that will be. And the way we did that is uh, encoding different parts of the so chunking up sequence into latent and encoding into latent space. And then predict in this latent space instead. Uh, and so you have a couple of knobs to tune. So, for example, how much you downsample this z will give rise to slower or faster features, and how far you're predicting in the future. So, that will basically end up, like, that will basically define the features you're going to learn. And then in downstream tasks, you can use either c, t, or z, t. Um, so maybe I'll more quickly go over the results because you've already seen those. Um, maybe let's talk about, like, for example, speaker classification and why it does so well there. It's because the negative samples are also from different speakers. So if you sample uh, negative samples in your data set, they're going to be from different speakers, right, on, on average. Because there are 251 speakers in the data set, the probability that the negative sample is from a different speaker is very high. So the first thing you do to get rid of those negative samples is just to learn the speaker. And that's exactly what the model does. And then to, to do much better on, than on other, like other parts, some, some samples are going to be very close to the current, uh, or like are, are from the same speaker, or like are close enough to the current um, positive. And then it's going to start to learn like the different phonemes and so on. Yeah. Uh, supervised is that it uh, everything in all of the parameters in this network are trained in a supervised way. Same network, yeah. So, yeah. So that, that's like the the best you could hope to do, I guess, with this architecture. Um, and so. You could also improve the architecture and both the supervised baseline and our network would do better. Um, but just to make sure we compare apples to apples. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so if you, for example, only use negatives that are from the same speaker, you're going to learn more about the phonetic content, and you will learn nothing about maybe, or like much less about uh, the, sp the speaker embedding. Um, and yeah, the, the distribution you use for the negative samples is really important. 
to make sure that I mean, for example, a hard negative mining I think would work to make uh, to make sure the model learns more and has a stronger signal to to learn. And that's also what they use, for example, in in FaceNet. They try to find very hard negatives, like faces that almost look exactly like the the one you're uh, trying to predict. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to, to use genetic models to come up like as the, the proposal distribution of the negatives. And hopefully that will make it harder, like make the model train harder uh, in some way. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, so the image net case, I guess it's also been discussed, but the, if you predict far enough in the image, like if, if the, for example, you're, you're going to skip the first image because it's partially overlapping, that's trivial, trivial to predict. So the loss will be just become zero immediately. The mutual information is too high. And the further you predict, the harder the task becomes, but, uh, the more signal that the model will have, uh, to learn. Some stuff that, that also helps here is to, for example, like jitter the, the the patches by taking random sixty by sixty subcrops, and the reason for that is like if there's a, like a strong line in the image, uh, the mutual information would be too high. For example, it would be too easy to know that all the negatives that don't have this kind of line in the image would be just immediately discarded. But if you jitter that, you're removing actually information from the X and Y pairs. So it becomes a harder task and you learn more of the of the useful stuff. The same is true for like uh, using grayscale. You get make sure that there are no like global nuisance variables at like associated with it, like the specific colors in the image and and also um, chromatic aberrations and so on. Um, yeah, so all of this is covered so I'll conclude here. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so we use negatives from the same image, but also uh, images, uh, batches from different images in the batch. So let's say the image batch is like 16 images, and um, there are like 49 patches here, and you have all the all the patches in this image, the other patches in the image, and also other, all the other patches in the, all the image, images are negative samples. And uh, the cool thing is that you don't have to, so, you don't have to explicitly like take some Im images from the training set and then encode them to use the negatives. You can use the negatives for all the other. Like, you you have to encode them anyway for doing the loss for a specific task. So you can use them as negatives in other tasks. There you go. Um, so, yeah, so you take 16 random images from the training set. So the mini batches to sample like you would normally do. And all the images that are, all the other 50 mini images in the, in the mini batch are also considered negatives. Um, but there, um, no, just the, the random different images. So every time, Every prediction, every time you do a certain prediction, that will be different negatives, um, and, and that's important. So yeah, just randomly like you would normally do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And an expectation, 
it, it's actually really important that you have random negatives. Otherwise, you're not sampling from a random distribution of like of negatives. Okay. Um, so there were there were class connection actually. So uh, every column is a different class. Yeah. Um, so we also I think we also did this with just the one the one stage, like the exact same encoder decoder that we used before, but we just used a bigger like pixel scene animated self attention, and that just gives much better samples. But these are 128 by 128. So the reconstructions from one stage, like if you, if you, for example, here, you only compress all the way down to the 32, 32 by 32 latent, and I try to reconstruct only from that image, you get very like noisy reconstructions, like on the left. So you really need the second stage to do well on 256 by 256. So that higher resolution kind of meets that. No, no, I'm thinking that self-supervised learning might catch up with supervised learning. So, uh, so like, class no, no, I, I mean, it's like an actual downstream perform, like downstream performance. So, for example, in our case, we, we in the ImageNet case, we, um, yeah. So we first train this model in a self-supervised way. And then we use these features to do classific classification, for example, right? That would be the downstream performance stuff. And now, uh, like, we are like at 48% or like 49% top one accuracy. But, like, 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 supervised methods still get like six, 78% or 80% top one accuracy. So there's still like a big gap between like what you can get for self supervised learning than what you get for super supervised learning. But these numbers are, really quickly changing all the time. So maybe we'll get, and maybe at some point we'll get close to like this profile learning uh, baseline. Yeah, maybe the last question. Thank you. No, so for for this, we only use the labels. So if the, the, the whole CPC architecture doesn't use any class labels. And then once the features are trained, so the whole model has converged, then we want to know like those representations that it learns, are those useful or not? Like do they capture the class information? Uh, and to know that we need to kind of either like do like some visualization or in our case we just train a linear classifier on top, on top of, on top of the linear uh, of, of, on top of the representations of CPC to see if those representations can linearly separate uh, they, if they linearly separate the class labels. So if it has some internal structure, some internal idea of what a class is, like what what this image is, if it has grouped together all the cats, if it has grouped together all the dogs in this in this representation by itself, and if it does, then a linear classifier would do really well on this task. And that's and for the linear classifier, we use all the labels. Yeah, but that's just to see how well they. The, how good the representations are. Yeah, that would be interesting to, to try. Uh, yeah. um, so the reason why we use a linear classifier is that because that that's what everyone has used so far, so far and that makes it uh, so we can compare it to these are. Um, so the the loss function is the 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 one I, I this is the CPC CPC loss basically. So 
this is like the probability that it assigns to a certain positive, like certain image being the positive. And we do um, softmax cross entropy. So that's that's the loss. So it, it, it's just like the classification loss over all the possible images that are, and then the probability that that, that being correct, that, that being the positive. So is it like a classification loss, which one is the real image and which one are the fakes? Um, in this case, C and Z are the output of a big encoder, and then F be just like a linear, linear, linear dot product. Yeah, yeah. And in the case of like the, I, it's not in this in this slide, but we have for different predictions we have different like um, linear matrix to make the dot products. Like it's like a bilinear product instead of like a dot product if you have different predictions in the future, like different number of steps. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very much.